Welcome to War Room, the official podcast of the U.S. Army War College online journal, graciously supported by the Army War College Foundation. Please join the conversation at warroom.armywarcollege.edu. We hope you enjoy the program. Make sure not to miss a single podcast and subscribe to A Better Peace, the War Room podcast at iTunes, Google Play, or your favorite subscription service. The views expressed in this presentation are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect those of the U.S. Army War College, U.S. Army, or Department of Defense. Welcome to A Better Peace, the War Room podcast. I'm Ron Granary, professor of history at the Department of National Security and Strategy at the U.S. Army War College and podcast editor of the War Room. It's a pleasure to have you with us. It's spring in Carlisle when every Army War College student's fancy turns to thoughts of oral comprehensive exams. For our future strategic leaders, one of the central challenges of comps is to relate contemporary issues to the classic texts presented to them by their faculty instructor. Top of that list is the Peloponnesian War by Thucydides, a book that strategists prolifically quote, whether they have read it or not, claiming to find this or that lesson to follow or trap to avoid. Ideally, one should have read such a complex and venerable text closely but you go into comps with the preparation you have rather than the preparation you want. And more than a few students have entered the exam room with more of a nodding acquaintance with the father of realism without really knowing their corsaira from their epidamnus. The potential outcome of such an encounter has recently been sketched by two Army War College faculty members, John Noggle and Matthew Wessner, whose article for the War Room entitled 10 Things I Learned by Skimming Thucydides has gone more viral and the plague of Athens. Here at A Better Peace, we delight in showcasing the work of War College colleagues, so it is a special treat to have both John Noggle and Matthew Wessner here to discuss their work, which some claim is satire, while others see it as depressing reality. Dr. John Noggle is Associate Professor of Warfighting Studies at the U.S. Army War College Department of Military Strategy Planning and Operations. A distinguished graduate of West Point and combat veteran, Dr. Noggle is the author of Learning to Eat Soup with a Knife, Counterinsurgency Lessons from Malaya and Vietnam, and Knife Fights, a Memoir of Modern War in Theory and Practice. Dr. Matthew Wessner is Professor of Institutional Research for the Office of the Provost at the U.S. Army War College, where he has taught courses in national security strategy, constitutional law, and research methods. While a faculty member at Penn State, he developed a course on the evolution of democracy in the ancient and early modern world. His current scholarship explores the impact of partisanship and ideology on American higher education. It's a delight to have you both here today in the virtual studio. Welcome to A Better Peace, gentlemen. It's good to be here, Ron. Good to be here. So what led the two of you to write this essay, 10 Things I Learned by Skimming Thucydides? Well... It started as something of a gag. I, I read John's book, Knife Fights, and it's just a fantastic text. You're the one. I heard somebody had read it. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, I got even on Audible. It, it's, it's available as an audio book. And it's, it's just a fantastic text kind of going through uh, John's history, uh, not only in, in kind of developing through his Army career, but how he came to counterinsurgency. Uh, I was just so interested in, in the depth of the book and all the different lessons it, it taught. I decided I would write to John a uh, top 10 list of the top 10 things I learned by reading Knife Fights. And it was in the same style where I took the exact opposite of the things he had argued and uh, sent them back to him as though I misunderstood the point. Uh, so, like, for example, which, which for if students, you know Matthew, it's not surprising that he might misunderstand the points of a, of a text, a, a complicated one like Knife Fights or a, a, an easier to understand one like Thucydides. Such as the Peloponnesian War. Well, so, in, I'll give you an example. Number two from, from my list I sent John was the army needs more officers who know how to tow the party line. America loses <laughs> wars because the army lacks experience in creating conformity and consensus. <laughs> well, and of, which of course, right there, we have the possibility of a whole nother podcast. So the, and, you know, I like that because the two things that you mentioned there, Matthew, are, are good reflections of the kinds of things that are in this article, which uh, we encourage our listeners to read on War Room if you haven't already, and the link to it will be included in the show notes for this program. But one of the great, uh, uh, like your, your 10 points on Thucydides starts with the very clear statement that war is predictable and anyone paying attention can see how it will turn out. 
um, which is the kind of lesson that somebody who has never read Thucydides would definitely learn from Thucydides. It's also the kind of lesson that someone who has ever fought in a war would know is absolutely and completely ludicrous. Uh, and, <laughs> and, and so one of the, the challenges of, of Thucydides, as you indicated in your intro, Ron, uh, is that there, there are people who think they are strategists who know of war only from books. And, and one of the, the points of, of Thucydides, one of the reasons he wrote his lessons to last forever was to try to warn people away from uh, perhaps the most basic human endeavor, but also the most risky, the most costly, uh, in many ways, the most awful. And, and so we, we um, want to make absolutely sure that that in particular i think in a, in a piece that is somewhat lighthearted, we underscore just how serious war is and and because of its 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 seriousness it deserves to be treated with the utmost respect and to be studied as as we encourage our students to do here at the Army War College, studied in great depth, right? Not skimmed, not skimmed, right? Studied in great depth, because of course, you know, number four on your top ten list is that democracies are particularly good at formulating and implementing long-term strategy, which um, is one of the, another one of those things that one should hope one didn't get that from Thucydides. One certainly doesn't get that from observing the current behavior of democracies and formulating long-term strategy. Um, I, go ahead, Matthew, please. I think it's worth, uh, as a setup, for those who haven't read the article, uh, we put this together as a parody of a student who's cramming for oral comms and decides to skim Thucydides rather than actually read it. Uh, and of course, there's a little bit of a painful truth to it, because oftentimes when people are reading through a text, especially something as dense as Thucydides, they'll just pick up little bits and pieces and think they got the gist of it. And, and so part of what we're doing here is showing lessons that people very well may draw from Thucydides or other historical texts that on the surface may seem perfectly plausible. When you dig deeper, there's a real uh, important counter lesson that's buried in the text itself. Right. Well, and, and Matthew, this is something I wanted to make sure I asked you to get us started as well. Is, uh, of the three of us, you have the most experience in teaching and assigning uh, classical texts. And uh, I... I do. Uh, I wonder what is your your sense of the ways that modern readers uh, uh, can or should approach uh, an ancient text like Thucydides, which can seem, especially, uh, even if the the topic uh, it can be pretty. Uh, you know, can feel very up to date, right? The the presentation and the style is very different from anything anybody else anybody is likely to have read before. And so, how do you how do you get people to to dig into a classical text and not to sort of bounce off the hard external surface of the uh, those big blocks of text that are usually when you open up a copy of any of the ancient Greeks. There are two big problems that uh, students encounter when they look at ancient texts. Uh, the first is, of course, sometimes they seem dense because they're not written in the, uh, the, the short, pithy style that we're used to in modern language. The second issue is if you get them to actually read the text, whenever there's an ambiguity, they will tend to impose their own 21st century views on whatever they're reading. Mm -hmm. uh, it's really easy for people to have preconceived ideas and to look at something that isn't entirely clear and presume that it agrees with the, what they already know. Yeah. Uh, so to get students to come in not only with an open mind, but to try to think about it in the context of an entirely different time is very challenging. And that's one of the reasons that Thucydides is so difficult. And yet the problems that they face seem so modern that mm -hmm. when a student gives a proper read to Thucydides, they're going to find all kinds of lessons that apply as much as they did uh, 2,500 years ago. Right. John, so coming at it from the, the other point of view, right, somebody who has practitioner experience, but is also has academic experience reading texts, how, how do you remember approaching texts like this as a student? Uh, but also, how do, you, how do you get through to a, to a group of practitioners to help them think about how they should approach a text like this? Yeah, I've just got to put a plug in for, for Robert Strassler's uh, edition of the Landmark Thucydides, which really, really, really helps. The, it's got commentary on the side, uh, a, a list of characters, but most importantly, it has maps. Mm -hmm. and, and so practitioners love maps. And, 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 and Matthew is exactly right. The problems that uh, 
Thucydides observed the Athenians struggle with during the war, the Spartans as well, the, the challenges they faced, geography, the, the challenges of coordinating maritime operations with ground operations, obviously air operations hadn't quite been invented yet, uh, but, but, but most of all the basic nature of humankind uh, and, and the greed and the fear, uh, honor and interest uh, that, that, that drove uh, this war that drove conflict that continue arguably to drive conflict, all those things make sense to to modern officers and and so if if you can make it accessible to them by by um, getting past the the challenges of the names and and the geography that they're probably not as familiar with as they are with the the terrain at Gettysburg or at normandy um, and 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 dig them into the maps and and make them confront the basic challenges that Thucydides described, you can often find that officers enjoy Thucydides more than any other part of their curriculum. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and in fact, so so things happened like uh, the, the, the turkey trot at, at the Army War College is named the Thucydides trot as, as an illustration of it's a, it's a, a foundational grounding experience for students at the Army War College and I believe still at all of our war colleges. I believe uh, I was I was uh, fascinated to discover that Thucydides was brought uh, was brought back into the curriculum at the at the war colleges in the 1970s. Um, that 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 there had been a period apparently where Thucydides had been considered uh, passe. Go ahead, John. Uh, and in fact, it was brought uh, to the Naval War College first by Stansfield Turner, a Rhodes right. Scholar, uh, Oxford man, uh, Naval Academy man, who was trying to get at the challenges the United States faced in Vietnam at a time when you couldn't openly discuss the challenges the United States faced in Vietnam. And I, I would say that we are facing a similar situation right now with Afghanistan here at the Army War College. But but so the Sicilian expedition uh, mm -hmm. was was a metaphor for the United States in Vietnam and, and allowed it allowed Turner to start an intellectual revolution at the war colleges that tried to make sure that we didn't make the same mistakes over again. We can have a long discussion about how successful that operation was. What we, what, what I think there is no debate about is that Turner really revitalized the intellectual rigor of the Naval War College and Thucydides was, was sort of the spearhead of that. And that spread from Newport to all of the services, right. and, and I, I think continues to resound today. Always more work to be done, but the Cities is a terrific place to start. Right. Well, and and this I think is is a question for both of you because it, it's the uh, you know all jokes aside, and we'll come back to more jokes. But um, but all jokes aside uh, 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 about not understanding Thucydides, right? One of the challenges with an old text, with an ancient text, one is that students will say, right, this has nothing to say to me because it's about a bunch of people whose names I can't pronounce. The flip side of that, though, is that people view an ancient text purely as a storehouse of quotations and pithily digested lessons that they only have to read uh, a couple of sentences. Um, my, perfect, my, my favorite example of this is anybody who thinks that when Thucydides has the Athenians say the strong do as they will and the weak suffer what they must in the Melian dialogue, anyone who thinks that that is the lesson that Thucydides wants you to take away from the book is showing you that they've never read the book both because of the context, because of what actually happens, and because of what happens right after that, which is the, the mighty Athenians blunder right into the Sicilian expedition, which destroys their whole house of cards. But, I, but this is what I think about is you know, when we try to figure out how to assign a text like this, how to engage with it with students, you know, we, encouraging them to see lessons is a good thing, but it can't just be about, you know, let's find something here that's the same as today, right? How do we balance between understanding the text for its own sake and understanding it as a storehouse of lessons and epigrams. Matthew, I want to go to you first on this. One of the things I always encourage students to do is to examine a text recognizing that the events in the ancient past never perfectly parallel what's happening today. So while there are certainly important examples where the Sicilian expedition will resemble elements of Vietnam, there are also important differences. Mm -hmm. And the ability to move back and forth to kind of see the parallels and recognize the differences is the key to trying to tease out some potential lessons. 
Uh, the second, as I mentioned, is not to just impose what you already believe on the text, to, to ask how does the text challenge what I already believe. Uh, and finally, it's to recognize, at least in my view, is that human nature is unchanged. Hmm. And so there are elements of, of war and conflict, which I don't believe will be different from now compared to 2,500 years ago. And, and to understand how these common principles of human nature uh, probably dominate international politics in modern times gives us a window into how to do it effectively. That's, that's terrific, Matthew. That's great. I agree with all of that. The, the other thing I try to do is, is one of the principles we try to teach here is strategic empathy. And, and um, we want our officers to be able to look at a strategic situation from the perspective of China, from the perspective of Iran. We're, we're, we're actually we're playing our, our big uh, uh, war game, our experiential learning exercise next week is join overmatch. And we actually have U.S. Army, Navy, Air Force, Marine students portraying the Chinese, and they are getting a sense for the war from the Chinese perspective, the the constraints of the first island chain from 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 China's perspective, the extraordinary need to to create it, to take the cork out of that uh, out of that bottleneck, which is is uh, arguably Taiwan. I, I'm, I'm I'm we try not to do too good of a job. They still don't support. China's goals, uh, <laughs> right? But 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 they they understand China better, and and if they can see the battlefield from the enemy's perspective, they are going to be able to better create strategies that will frustrate that enemy and help accomplish American objectives and preserve freedom and democracy around the globe. You can start that by looking at the the for putting yourself back twenty five hundred years, uh, understanding the geography of the Peloponnese, understanding the strategic challenges the Spartans saw, the, the, the extraordinary maritime capabilities of the Athenians, uh, but their weaknesses, their comparative weaknesses in ground forces. And, and so by, by picking yourself up and moving yourself back 2,500 years, if you can make that move, it's a whole lot easier to six months later, nearing the end of the school year, pick yourself up and put your, yourself in the perspective of, of President Z and, mm -hmm. and work inside your own head to understand China's strategy for uh, the, the, the conflict that we all hope to prevent through our work here at the War College, including our work helping American students and 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 uh, allied students are there are nearly eighty allied students here, friends and partners from around the globe. Uh, but but we we also it would be great if the Chinese war colleges were reading Thucydides too, mm -hmm. and and I, I I hope they spend a bunch of time reading the story of the Sicilian expedition as well. These lessons apply uh, across time, across space, across systems of government. Um, and, and, and are the foundation, I would argue, for the work we do in, in helping our students understand the world in which they're going to be strategic leaders. Well, and, and John, you know, you, you brought up the point of, of types of government. And of course, one of the one of the uh, one of the actual traps that comes from reading Thucydides, you know, I was going to use that word, but I'm, uh, but one of the actual traps is everybody knows everybody thinks they know that Athens is the democracy and Sparta is the oligarchy. And Athens gets uh, the Athenian leaders get the best lines. Pericles gets to give a whole speech about how great Athens is. And so Americans have often wanted to identify themselves with Athens. Um, but here's where I'm going to pause and say this is a spoiler alert for those of you who haven't read the book yet. But I encourage you to probably, I don't know if they're going to be a spoiler for a 2,500 year old book. Athens doesn't win the Peloponnesian War. Um, and what I find very interesting is when Americans sometimes talk about, you know, there was Pericles' funeral oration, which celebrates Athenian democracy as the school of Hellas, is in book two of eight of a book that actually doesn't even go to the end of the war. Um, and so I think for Americans in particular, right, the interesting is, is to, to see that the book is written by an Athenian who, is, who knows how the war is going to turn out and is not happy about it. And he is in part telling a tragic story about the mistakes that Athens made. And yet there's a superficial reading of the book, which emphasizes the glories of Athens, which misses this larger point that Thucydides is trying to make. Um, and it also creates all this confusion when people don't know how they're supposed to map this onto, um, map this onto contemporary politics is, you know, who are the, you know, who is Athens and who is Sparta? Um, I, I, I'll, I'll say one thing from the first time I read this book was my freshman year in college. 
um, and we read certain sections of it. And the um, uh, the lecture that I heard on on Palpatine War was by Professor Stanley Hoffman. Um, so most of these words I can only hear in Stanley Hoffman's accent. But um, Stanley Hoffman would tell a story about being at a lecture where one of his former colleagues and rivals um, at the university that they were at, a future Secretary of State whose name rhymes with, rhymes with you know, Fenry Fissinger, um, that, um, that that future Secretary of State was talking about that the, the Cold War was like the Peloponnesian War, but like Athens, the United States will prevail in this conflict. And Hoffman told that story to everybody. <laughs> Obviously, he took great pleasure in telling that story. Um, so the, the question is, there is actually a question in all this for both of you is, you know, students may want to see, uh, may, may want to identify the heroes and the villains, right? They want to decide which is the good guy so they'll know who they're supposed to root for in this story. But how do we encourage students to see that there is value in both understanding your adversary? So understanding what the Spartans were trying to do, for example, but also understanding the, the real power of a story where the good guys actually mess it all up and lose. So th this, of course, was one of our our, our points, uh, our, our satirical points, was that democracies are are good at strategy, uh, and 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 always come to the right decision. And, and of course, we have have seen um, in in our lifetimes the United States make what what I consider to be great overreaching errors, uh, mm -hmm. in particularly the invasion of of Iraq in March of two thousand three. Uh, despite the fact that Saddam Hussein literally had nothing whatsoever to do with the attacks of September 11th, a, a mistake that has cost the United States dearly and will continue to cost the United States dearly, likely for many generations to come. The recent loss in Afghanistan, uh, in no small part, I would argue, a, a result of the, fa the, the, the mistaken in, invasion of Iraq in 2000. And three, and 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 so this is this makes the 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 fact that the Athenians are the good guys, right? In in quotes, but but nonetheless fail, is arguably the biggest single point of the book. That the fact that we enjoy the benefits of a democracy, that we are now the the world's oldest democracy and, and are, are, are showing in, in, in Ukraine that we are the defenders of democracy around the globe, that doesn't mean we're destined to win. That, that depends upon the good decisions made, the valor, the historical understanding, the, the moral principles of the leaders of this country, a number of whom passed through our doors here at, at Carlisle Barracks at the Army War College. And so I really think that, that that point, perhaps above all others in the book, illustrates the importance of not skimming, but reading, <laughs> digesting, grappling with Thucydides. And, and it is one of the reasons uh, I, I hope they take that lesson with them. That this is something I emphasize in class almost almost literally every day, that they're being given here at this school an extraordinary opportunity to think strategically and to learn by the American people. And the American people have a right to expect them to work diligently at that, um, to, to dig in hard into the text that we ask them to read, including Thucydides, and to help their golf game a little bit here and there on the really, really nice afternoons. Like, like today, for example. But um, Matthew, uh, you know, as someone who has a broader experience than John or I in teaching the classics as well, um, I, I wanted to think about how do we, uh, uh, are there other texts that people who want to uh, draw from the classical tradition to understand strategic questions. Are there other texts that rival Thucydides in, in, in value? Uh, uh, you know, do you as a classicist appreciate the focus that we put on Thucydides here the way that, say, John and I do, because maybe we don't know any better? I think my history professor colleagues would take exception with me being called a classicist. Ah. I'm not quite that well trained. Fair. But uh, I, I can say that when I taught the, the course on democracy in the ancient world at Penn State, mm -hmm. I did uh, always start with Plato's Republic. Mm -hmm. Because, and we didn't go through the entire text, I, the first five books is sufficient. But when we talk about how difficult it is to do something as simple as define justice, 
students get a sense for how the ancients were grappling with many of the same problems that we face today. So that, that was a kind of a, a foundational text to, to set up some of the very real problems of governance. Mm -hmm. But perhaps more significantly, when I started that course, and I actually created it for Penn State, I always began with a sober reminder to the students that all democracies die, it's just time, that nothing can go on forever. And someday historians will sift through the ashes of the American Republic and ask what went wrong. Now, without being overly pessimistic, you know, it could be another thousand years, but I say that it is their duty to, in their generation, keep it alive. And so we study many of these ancient texts and we look at the tragedies of, of the failure of republics in the ancient world so that we can understand maybe how to keep ours going for a little bit longer. Uh, it's, there's, no, there's no easy answer and there's no text that's going to lead us to the right uh, conclusion. But the very ability to grapple with some of the issues that were faced by the ancients gives us a little bit of a leg up. That's terrific, Matthew. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I certainly like that. And I guess that that's why we do this. Um, I, I, I will ask a, f a final question for both of you based on your essay, which I, as I say, people should take a, a look at. It's a, uh, it's, it's a much, it's a much shorter read than the Peloponnesian War itself. Um, but um, what's your favorite lesson? of the 10 lessons that you, uh, that you can get from skimming Thucydides. I'll go with you first, Matthew. Uh, I would say uh, number three, if uh -huh. you experience a tactical setback, send more troops until your policy is inevitably vindicated. <laughs> I, I, I think that that little quote can apply to so many conflicts uh, in ancient and modern times that I, I, I will fondly cite this as an example of uh, a strategy that's always worth pursuing. Excellent. John? Uh, and my favorite is number 10. Uh, there are no enduring principles of international relations, and we have nothing to learn from the ancient past. And uh, as we've just heard very movingly, uh, in my eyes, uh, ears, at least from Matthew, um, the, the, the importance of this book to me is that, is that Thucydides is arguably the father of international relations. He is the first to blame, place causality for events on human agency and not on the gods. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and um, if, if you believe, as, as I do, that um, while, while some things are beyond human control, that, that humans have enormous influence, and if you believe, as I do, that war is among the most powerful and important of, of human endeavors, not the best, but the most important, then you have to, based on that, you have to study war. You have to take the study of war seriously from 2,500 years ago in the history of the Peloponnesian War to the studies uh, I'm a part of uh, literally today at the Army War College trying to garner lessons from the, the horrific Russian invasion of Ukraine. And, and, and the principles continue to apply. The character of war changes. Thucydides didn't understand drones or air defense weapon systems, but he absolutely understood the courage and the determinations that the Ukrainians are, are demonstrating as they fight to defend their homes and, and as the, 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 the families that they love and, and as they draw on the support of allies around the globe who support their democracy and support their right to live free. <laughs> so history matters. That's why we study it here. It doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes. And, and you have to understand human nature and you have to understand history so that you can make new and exciting mistakes instead of the same old mistakes that we've been making for thousands and thousands, thousands of years. Of years. Because that's the thing is, right? History, history changes. Um, we remain just as flawed as people in the past because we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. We don't know what that, uh, what those future historians will say about us, but we try to make, uh, we try to take advantage of what freedom we have to make the decisions that we have so that we can make our own mistakes. Well, it certainly wasn't a mistake to have the two of you on this program, and it wasn't a mistake to uh, to publish your article, which I hope everyone will read. I do hope that people will appreciate both the, uh, let's say, good satire comes from uh, from a uh, from a core of affection, I would argue, or a core of genuine interest. And so, the joking ways that people can get Thucydides wrong comes from a strong desire or a strong belief, let's say, that getting Thucydides right is important. 
Um, and, and it's so, worth the effort. And it's worth the effort. So John Noggle, Matthew Westner, thanks for coming on A Better Peace to talk about your work and good luck going forward, especially if you're going to be examining people in oral comprehensive exams later on in March. Thanks, Matthew. Thanks, John. Thanks, Thanks Ron. Ron. And thanks all of you for listening in. Uh, we do appreciate you joining us. Please uh, let us send us your comments on this program and all the programs. Send us your suggestions for future programs. We're always interested in hearing from you. Please, if you have not yet subscribed to A Better Piece, which frankly is something that historians will argue you should have done by now. But uh, if you haven't yet, please subscribe to A Better Piece on your podcatcher of choice and rate and review this podcast so that we can continue to grow the community for conversations like this one. Even if this conversation is over, we look forward to welcoming you to the next one. And so until next time, from the War Room, I'm Ron Granary. And that concludes our program. Thank you for listening. The views expressed in this podcast reflect those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views, policies, or positions of the U.S. Army or the Department of Defense. Let us know what you think. Provide us your feedback, comments, or suggestions through our webpage at warroom.armywarcollege.edu. And have a great day.